Well, that's absolutely astonishing. I'm really excited to be here today. Um, I even took a vacation to come, you know. And um, but first things first, and as you might already see, that I'm working for Nokia Hero Maps. I'm working on those maps you see right now. I'm working on like a bunch of pretty decent stuff, like rendering stuff, uh, JS API. Awesome. And before, I used to work for a um, Russian search giant called Yandex and uh, in this nice, cozy office in Kiev. But this time, this time I'm going to talk about something that I learned about uh, while working in my spare time on my side project. And to be more precise, I'm going to talk about some flavors of functional programming, some reactive stuff, and uh, taking pieces of the, uh, those technologies and applying them to JS. I'm pretty sure that there are people that is already familiar with the talk, and for those of you, I can only suggest like watching the same film, but now like it's in 3D, you see. And um, as I have said, that um, I've been working on some side project for sharing a file between peers, kind of a, like Snapchat for files, right? And for me, that was just uh, a good opportunity to, to try WebRTC in in the wild. And um, there will be no another introduction to WebRTC. You can ask Phil. We had already <laughs> a great session yesterday on this topic. And instead, I just want to like, show you a very simple scheme of uh, how this file transfer thing works for me. And so, for example, there is an Alice and Bob, right? Uh, OK, there is a phone and desktop. And I want to send something from the phone to the desktop. As you already know that, first I have to make some signaling. I have to, to send messages. I have to wait asynchronously uh, for messages back. And if everything is like, OK, then the data channel uh, might be created. And at this point, uh, you can start splitting your file into chunks of every buffer and like throwing it right into the face of Bob over the network. And the first gotcha is that actually, your data channel has a finite capacity. And that's why at some point you have to make a pause and uh, wait till your chunks will be consumed, then continue, then again make a pause, and so on. And you see that everything is inherently uh, asynchronous. Even um, splitting a file into chunks of um, every buffer is asynchronous. And everything can fail, because that's network stuff. There are so many things that can fail, that can error. It's incredible. and. Uh, Data channel can just unexpectedly close, or signal server can be shut down, and it's important for users that you will gracefully recover from those situations, that your system is resilient. And um, I'm not going to say that you can't do this. I mean, obviously you can. I just uh, don't want to go this way. And um, obviously, callbacks is not the only choice, and um, you can go with events, right? I mean, if you really feel adventurous, you can like catch them all and uh, be okay. But even besides those obvious issues like that debugging is hard and um, it's quite complicated to subscribe to a combination of events. For example, if you want to listen to event B, but each time it happens after event A, things are going like a bit more complicated. But for my case, it's more important that uh, memory footprint. Uh, because there is plenty of chunks that's being sent over the network, to represent such a chunk, such a piece of array buffer being sent, I have to create an event object to rep represent it. And uh, because I can have like thousands and thousands and thousands of those chunks, it immediately leads to a problem of uh, uh, geekups of uh, garbage collector. That's the main uh, point. And it's not something you want to have in your application, right? So it looks like that we are missing like the right abstraction, um, the right abstraction to build like inherently asynchronous applications, and that's an issue. But even besides it, um, there are other inherent problems of how we do things right now. So like this approach of structuring your applications with objects and writing imperative code, it's like a synonym of uh, programming right now. I mean, it's okay. I mean, it's Nothing fancy. But if you think what happens, I mean, those are just my thoughts, uh, what I found really compli uh, complex when working with such an approach. 
that, uh, for example, you build your applications of some pieces of blocks. And those blocks are just chunks of functionality, and hopefully it has some predefined uh, interface. And you start building your applications. You take one block, you combine it with another, and you receive a third block. And each block has like kind of interface, right? And obviously you have to implement it first. But then each interface should be tested as well, and it should be maintained later on. And you see that using such a natural way of doing things, we just, uh, each time we only increase the complexity. We introduce new blocks, we combine them, we receive new things we have to maintain, new entities in the system. And now you can like, have a look at your big class and uh, with plenty of methods. And those methods, they, what they do, they actually they share some properties of an object, which is done in, implicitly. And if you will take this idea like to an extreme, you will think that actually sharing properties between methods of an object is not much better than sharing a global variable between functions. It's better, but not to some degree. And then, obviously, your building blocks, they have some states, because they are mutable. I mean, the, the whole idea of uh, objects is encapsulation of some state. And uh, I would say that each time when you combine those blocks and you build a new one, what you have to do, you have to check each combination of states of its building blocks to prove that it works correctly, that everything like, was done properly. And at this point, we see that, I mean, the only thing that these slides really shows you that we're really bad at managing complexity. Instead, we are really good at increasing it. Like, each time when I go to the office, by the end of the day, I just, what I did, I just increased the complexity of the overall system. That's it. And uh, I think that's the most natural thing of uh, a way you have to try to mitigate those uh, inherent flaws of our way of doing things is to refer to declarative programming. It's kind of antagonist to imperative one. It's, kind of, it's when you tell like what rather than how. It's when you just specify a regex and you just check, is it an email or not? Yes, no? Okay. You don't care about like creating tries out of letters than performing, I don't know, some graph traversal on it. Just, is it an email? No, yes. That's it. So our first point, our first stop would be functional programming. That's an example of value-oriented declarative one. I'm not going to go into like deep, precise uh, definitions taken from Wikipedia of what it is and what are the entities inside it. Instead, I just want to walk you through the main concepts main ideas behind it, and uh, to look into them, why they actually reduce complexity, why they matter. So, like, that's a hype. I mean, everybody knows that in functional programming, like, everything is immutable. And because everything is immutable, you don't need assignments at all. I mean, you can't change anything. It's like a destiny. There is no choice in functional programming, right? Besides, there is no loops, and there is no switch statements as well. And the reason is, like, Pretty simple, that uh, loop condition is immutable as well, and that's why it will never change again, and that's why it doesn't make much sense. And uh, it doesn't mean that you can't, you can't iterate, right? Obviously you can, and you can do this through the power of recursion. And many of you, like the first thought that comes to mind when I tell recursion is like stack overflow. And uh, it's just good to know that in ECMAScript 6, as we, you have been already told by Excel that we will have this so-called tail call optimization, a technique that each time when you try to recurse in some preconditions, it will uh, reuse current stack call frame instead of creating a new one. So theor theoretically, you might have like kind of infinite recursion if you need this. And that's good to know, like Java doesn't have it, right? Why not? And next thing, next concept, uh, pretty powerful in functional programming is so referential transparency. And it's based like on two simple ones. First, that functions don't have side effects. That means that you uh, shouldn't throw errors uh, in functions or modify incoming arguments. And second is idempotence. So function is idempotent if uh, you can call it as many times, but provided, uh, being provided with the same arguments, it will always return the same result. Maybe it would be better to grasp an idea of what is idempotence if you will think of HTTP GET. 
HTTP GET is idempotent in the sense that you can cache it, you can scale it horizontally. This is what makes it powerful. The overall power of this referential transparency is that you don't have any implicit uh, dependencies. Your function is not doing anything behind your back. What's going, on uh, what's going into function completely defines what's going out. So it's easier to reason about your function. It's easier to reuse them and to test. Another way of <laughs> thinking of functional programming, I would say you can compare it to Unix philosophy. It's kind of um, to pipelining in Unix. For example, here is a quote from the author of uh, Unix Pipes. And he said that each program must uh, do one thing, but well. And you should expect that output of one program will be an input of another one. And this is absolutely true for functional programming as well. It's nice when your function has one precise thing that it does well. And um, the last point, that when you have a functions that accept arguments and produce values of the same interface, you kind of, when combining them, for example, when chaining them in JS, you, you have kind of a collapse of, uh, collapse of interfaces. Because you, you combine things, you combine building blocks. In a case of functional programming, that's a functions. But you don't increase the number of interfaces being involved. So it, some kind of, in some way, it reduces, uh, in some scenarios, complexity of doing things. And I'm pretty sure that you have been doing th this before. Like when we receive this ECMAScript 5 features, like array map, array reduce things. And each time when you have been like mapping over an array and then trying to filter this and then reduce this, the result to an object or to a value, you have been using exactly this technique that your interfaces was collapsing and it made things easier for you to work with. And at this point, when we have touched on text streams in Un and piping them in Unix, it makes sense to proceed to next our stop. It's reactive programming. That's an example of uh, declarative data flow paradigm. And at current, like by now, the main issue why we can't just embrace the power of a functional programming in JS because it doesn't solve our main issues. Remember like the slide with this file transferring thing that the main issues were error handling, asynchronous uh, behavior. And functional reactive doesn't answer them, at least those concepts that I've been talking about. And the reason is because those are examples of side effects and functions should not that have them. But what if we will we will generalize them. We will try to find such an abstraction that allows us to work with the asynchrony, with error ha errors, like any other values in a system. It sounds kind of, it maybe doesn't make much sense for you. Like generalize things that have absolutely different semantics, like asynchrony and errors and values, right? But let me convey uh, to you what I'm like talking about. What is generalization? In, in my opinion. So, for example, if you will try to generalize like value and the value, you will come up with something like iterators collection. For it uh, means that you can get one value or you can get both values. And for example, callbacks is an abstraction on top of asynchrony and the value. So you can get a value asynchronously or you can get your stuff being done asynchronously. And promises are the last most modern toy is an abstraction on top of value, asynchrony, and errors. And what are we, and the last piece that is missing, it's some kind of generalization of things, of uh, abstracting out of uh, many asynchronous value, uh, asynchronous error handling. And instead of just like throwing on you the fact, what is this? Like, what is the definition of an answer? Uh, I would try to derive it. and. To do this, I'm gonna pick iterator. I mean, it's there is so many. I mean, there you can get any abstraction you already have, like callbacks, promises, or whatever, and co go with this one. But using iterator, I believe that it would be more clear how reactiveness is involved in this yeah. section. And so, iterator it has usually like two synchronous methods to check whether there is any value left and to check whether 
and, and to acquire the next value. And now I'm gonna inter like add a synchrony to the interface of iterator. And to do this, I'm gonna like invert. I make I'm gonna make an inversion of control. So before we have been pulling values out of iterator, and now let's allow new interface um, to push values on us. So instead of uh, synchronously calling and checking whether there is a uh, next value, let's add on completed methods that um, will, be, will notify us when there is no values left, right? And instead of next methods, let's inter introduce on next callback that will be called for us each time when a new asynchronous value is ready and has arrived. And at this point, we have kind of bijection between those two interfaces, our secret one and iterator. And the main difference is that we have um, inversion of data flow. So right now, what we have is producer pushing values to a consumer, and the consumer has to react to them. And at this point, you start feeling that what is this reactiveness all about? It's about pushing values onto the consumer rather than interactively pulling it. But we are still missing the last piece. It's uh, error handling. And I think that we can, just, we can just pick it from promise and add on error callback. And I think that it's time to just to name it. Like It's called int observable. One of the names currently used, mostly, most widely used. And if you're still wondering, I mean, observable, I mean, how it like fits the, the all other ideas, I mean, concepts that I know, here is just like other kind of looking onto the problem. So collection, for example, it refers to a value the same way as observable refers to a promise in some sense. Or for example, promises and observables I, uh, both push value from producer reactively to consumer. This is just other way of thinking around it. What we essentially did, like, so, but right, we have this reactiveness thing. It's kind of an inversion. And uh, why it's matter? Because right now, you don't have to store intermediary results. Because right now, um, you don't have to wait till somebody will ask for those results. You can reactively push it, like a, like, like a hot potato. You just push, push, push it through your system, and updates are propagated right to your UI. So it consumes less memory, what is important, for example, for my case of sending file, chunks of files. And also, errors are first-class citizens, the same way as they are, for example, in promises. You can, you can handle them asynchronously, you can chain them, like do any fancy stuff you used to do with the simple values. And eventually, so now, using this observable interface, we have abstracted, we have encapsulated those side effects that were preventing us from using uh, functional programming. So now all of this is hidden inside some interface that can go into a function and go out of function with all side effects inside it. And if you will implement some functions like map or reduce, so-called higher order func functions, but uh, which will operate now on observables rather than on collections, you can start working like with asynchronous values, with asynchronous error handling, in the same way as you do with the just ordinary array. And obviously, such libraries already exist. For example, to name few, there is reactive extensions. There is back in JS, Kefir JS, but they obviously they differ in some ideas, but all of them share the main idea that they implement higher order functions for observables. And at this point, I have not enough time to go into details and to discuss how I was applying those, like going deep into uh, syntax, uh, how I was applying these observables for my case, but just imagine that there is some transfer page, some simple UI with uh, some average speed, time left, some, what's there left? Some sp speed, right? And just, just look at the actual implementation. I mean, 
that's pieces of uh, functionality. This is the only functionality that is required to render this UI except the templates. Obviously, there is no templates in it. And you see, like, there is not much of it. It's, it's really compact. And when you are familiar with the methods of uh, reactive extensions library, it's absolutely awesome. Let's put it this way. <laughs> Expressive. That was the word I was missing. And you see that I need like two lines to add a chunk of uh, speed, current speed, which is inherently changing, uh, changing piece of UI and quite complicated if you would like to implement it using callbacks out of just arriving data chunks. And I'm reusing, I'm combining things, I'm creating intermediary observables that can, which are shared between those three elements. But unfortunately, I don't have time today to go into much details, but I'm pretty sure that you can find like, plenty of awesome talks by the author of uh, Reactive Extensions Library. And I was using these observable things for data streams, kind of. And it's, they're pretty similar, and uh, it's an easier way of thinking about it. But it doesn't mean that you can use observables only for streams of data. You can, uh, everything that changes over the time can be represented with observables. For example, if, you'll, if you will think about mouse cursor position as an observable, and if you, if you will combine it with itself, but shift it in time, you can easily implement kind of things like gestures handling, like dragging of things, or drag and drop, whatever. It's super powerful technique, yes. I think many of you now will like kind of like go home and learn a bit more about this, because let's talk more about inspiring and more about giving you an idea rather than going into precise um, quotes from Wikipedia. And I think that it's not going to happen. You're not going to write functional reactive programming. You're not, you're not going to do this. And the reason is because we have been discussing functional programming and reactive programming. And functional reactive plus reactive, functional programming plus reactive programming doesn't equal FRP. And indeed, reactive extensions library, that's not FRP library at all. Uh, you should probably call this compositional event processing. Yeah, it's kind of confusing. And here is a quote by an inventor of FRP, and he said that actual libraries like BaconJS or ErecJS, they are missing two fundamental uh, concepts that the, the original FRP was based on. And he, he says that an accurate description of those libraries would be compositional event systems inspired by FRP. And if you wonder I mean, why, I mean, why it's not FRP, uh, here is super condensed answer, which doesn't make much sense. That it tells us that it's not FRP because it misses continuous time and denotative semantics. And again, you shouldn't expect from me some desc uh, description on those terms. And instead, I gonna, I want to share with you like kind of my understanding of things and. Um, I would say that a RegJS or, or Bacon JS refers to FRP the same, ways, the same way as BMP image refers to an SVG image. And this is because if you will think of a time as a space, then um, and try to zoom into your space, zoom into your image, into your FRP, in the case of SVG, you will have the same precise crispy image, but zoomed in. And in the case of BMP, in, in the world of ERIC.js, you have only a um, sequence of pixels. And uh, when you start zooming into it, you lose the precision. And this is like a very rough intuitive description of what's the core difference between concepts. So for me, at this point, I would say that, like, at least, <laughs> that Kind of FRP is that for me in my heart, and long live compositional event systems. Yeah, and now this boring stuff that you can uh, find me by my private email on Twitter, and obviously later on I will tweet those slides. And obviously, the 
projects that I was have been working on and have been using those observable things, reactive extensions, React.js. And by the way, React.js is not an, a reactive library. Here is tilifile.me. And I think that I, I've launched it right for the conference and only one day before the start, and that's why there is no link to the source, but I will tweet it so you can like look how I was testing things, uh, how you can synchronously test a synchronous behavior, which is insane as well. And I think that's pretty all. I mean, if you wish, what I can do, for example, I can, I can make a small demo how observables works, but you won't see this. Instead, you will see side effects. I'm going to go to this telefile.me or will not, because I don't have internet. <laughs> and that's why, thank you very much. <laughs> and I hope there is no questions. <laughs> there is food. Whew, secured, no questions, no hard stuff. Okay. <laughs>